the mirror for that kid who was teasing you for being short or for me for being, you know, dry skinned and stuttering, that kid at some point realized, okay, I'm overweight or my dad left mm. my family. And if I bully this kid, I feel different. I Correct. Don't feel pain. I feel power. Correct. So be it now and then it will come to you. You can't wait till you get it to become that thing. Welcome, you guys, to the DNA of Greatness podcast. I am your host, Aquarius Wave, and this right here is my uncle, closer than blood, closer than any other, my mentor, and one of my best friends in this entire world, Coach Bobby Bluefield. Would you like to say what's up to the people, Coach Bobby? What's up, guys? Always glad to be here with my nephew, with my boy Aquarius. Uh, we're going to dive into some some real some real deep stuff today that I, that we believe impacts everybody. So hold on tight, guys. We're gonna be better than yesterday tomorrow. Let's get it. So, um, we tried to uh, film this podcast just a little bit ago, but we're having some technical difficulties. We said, you know what, the devil ain't gonna stop a damn thing on this side of earth. No, no. So that being said, uh, I just really wanted to reiterate. Uh, first and foremost, our subject matter today and why I believe that it matters so much to every single person that is listening to this today uh, or any point in time that you may listen to this in your journey. And that is the topic of healing slash listening to the inner child. Now, this was something that was brought up to my consciousness, um, I believe it was almost two years, three years ago from around this time when Coach had reiterated to me that he had discovered the true core, the true reason as to why he had the hangups he had, et cetera, and really had this kind of breakthrough moment. And I actually, I, I didn't remember this in the first recording, but it's kind of coming up to mind now, is I saw the first true changes in you when that happened. There was that realization of that inner child and the impact of that inner child within your own experience and your you know, life 30 years after, you know, that child's everyday existence. And what happened for me, at least, was a year, almost two years after that date, I started having my own emotional healing journey. And that story came up to me. And it rung so true because I finally understood the importance of truly paying attention to that inner child, understanding that inner child, and developing a, a healthy relationship because right. that is a part of us and a part of us that oftentimes goes uh, neglected or even is not seen or recognized at all. Some of us don't even realize that every waking moment of our lives, we have this inner child that is truly dictating the decisions that we make, the lives that we lead, the beliefs that we hold on to. So, Unc, if you uh, don't mind but reiterating when it is that you first had that discovery of that inner child. Right. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. That was a, a, a great lead up. And, you know... It's funny because we are redoing this this video um, from the start because the devil was trying to stop us. It won't happen. It ain't ever gonna happen. Nope. If, if, even if Absolutely. even if we have to restart the game four or five times, we still gonna play. Um, Talk to him. But 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 then you 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 realize some things you may have said wrong or that you can add to. So mm. so it's actually a benefit to to redo it. Uh, my realization that there was this part of me that was holding me back came to me uh, when I first discovered that that God wanted me to speak, right? I had been doing all this, these these different avenues of, of success. I called it greatness. I've, I've, I've rechanged what greatness really is because of what we are talking about today, which I'll get into. But I had been doing all these things to try to be successful and great and achieve. It was football. It was finance. Then it was, you know, trying to be the best father and husband I could be and, and, and excelling outwardly at that and making sure that it was visible, that I was doing great as a husband and father. Mm -hmm. And then it was being fit as, you know, for myself and into my later ages. And then it was building a fitness brand that, that directly embodied physicality and directly uh, involved an outwardly expression of what I thought was was success and achievement. And it struck me that what I had to do in order to help people get to where I was at, because 
from a very early part of my of my of my life, I knew that I enjoyed teaching people, right? And in mm-hmm. fact, I wanted to be a teacher early on in my life until I realized it required speaking, and I, I was afraid to speak. But I've always had this this desire to help people, and my mom was the same way, and and so she always, you know, pushed on me not in a, not in a bad way, but she always saw in me that same desire. So any kid who was younger than me, she brought to our home and I was like their mentor, right? As a military, you know, family, we always had new families in the neighborhood coming in. And early on in my dad's career, there were many families that were going through what what they had gone through, you know, low pay, you know, a weird environment you're not used to, uh, having to raise children, oftentimes in foreign countries and foreign areas. And so every family that had kids younger than me, my mom would have me mentor them. So I've been coaching and mentoring people younger than me literally since I was like 10 years old. When I was 10, they were seven. When I was 12, she brought home nine-year-olds. When I was in high school, she brought home... In fact, there's kids, there's kids, there's grown people today that were kids when I was younger who still ping me on social media and called me big brother, like literally. And so I, I saw that, but then... Around the age of 12 and 13, I realized how fearful I was of speaking because of my stutter. Mm. So that kind of held me back. But around when you met me, I really saw a need to teach people the underbelly of what success in, in fitness was. And I began to see parallels in life of, of the underbelly, mm. the core tenets of what makes success achievable. But I, I want to jump in for a yeah, yeah, yeah. say. The, the first day we met, um, I don't know how long we were standing in place, but it, it might as well have been, you know, two to three hours. And the first thing that caught me was, and you obviously know, but our audience might not know. At the time, I was, you know, basically selling these meal prep packages, uh, looking to build my way either in marketing or sales. I wasn't too certain in which direction I wanted to go into, but I essentially created this list of different Uh, personal trainers that I wanted to kind of introduce myself to and sell these products to. And what happened was, you know, down that list was this guy, Coach Bobby Bluford. And so thought to pay him a visit, drive over to a spot. And he's, you know, one of the guys who who welcomed me in with open arms. And I had never had a discussion like that in my entire life, right? Like I've been this type of individual, but it was always so suppressed or I felt like I wasn't really understood. Um, there were aspects of me I would even shame because I was just a little different on the things that I cared most about. And of course, I had, you know, deep conversations here and there. But when it came to just a conversation about greatness, like about, you know, what it takes to be great, somebody breaking down even nuances of, you know, the, the G tank and ketosis when, you know, it wasn't a mainstream idea, et cetera. Like it was a world of of information, but a world of I think it was just like, it was just so real for me, right? It wasn't like a professor trying to tell me something that I knew they weren't living. Right. It's like, I could look at you and be like, this dude is speaking what he's living, mm-hmm. right? So I just wanted to point uh, that out and also just give you your flowers. I think that's oh, important. Yeah, thank you. It's just like, that was a very real moment for me. And I, I think that was a catalyst of, you know, the relationship that we have now at this point. Right, 100%. And, and what's cool about what happened, it was probably... So I was I was finishing up my morning block of classes, and I remember mm-hmm. it like it was yesterday. So I was getting I was packing my car up. I had just finished working out, and and back then I was doing I was getting up at four a.m. You know, driving from Gilroy, California, which is which is south of San Jose. For those who are watching, and my boot camp was in San Jose, so it was a thirty minute drive. Uh, I would get there by six. I would train yep. until twelve train people until 12 and then I will work out. So you caught me on that day as I was, I was packing up and I, and I, and I remember like literally just, just being joyous to serve people and opportunity to just teach somebody, you know, somebody, some young eager person about just how to, how to chase greatness in life. Cause it wasn't about, it was about the meal prep, but that conversation could could have been three minutes. Absolutely. Right? What do you? Is it all protein? Yes. Is it? Is it? Is it containered? Yes. Is can you deliver it three times a week? Yes. Okay. Well, that could have been it, 
but right. it got into everything. It got into not only how the body works and, and physical fitness stuff, but more importantly, how, how I had begun to apply those tools to other things. Right. Mm. So, um, that, and then, and then for those who are watching, what happened after that is, is he was the salesperson. Aquarius was the salesperson. And then the fulfillment team fell through and didn't do their job. So mm. I actually had, I remember I told you I had a, my, one of my first speaking events was the following weekend at the gym. Yeah. I was going to do like a, a talk on like the five steps to greatness for fitness. Right. And they didn't show up with the kit, with the free catering. No big yeah. deal. I mean, I no big deal. It was like, it was only an hour and a half or whatever it was. But I remember you called me back and you said you were, how sorry you were that they hadn't done it. I said, Oh, no big deal. But that led to our involvement in everything from, from that mm. point on social media, and doing speaking, and you you saw in me you saw in me this part of me, which led me to get into how I found the inner child. But you but you saw in me what my mom saw in me thirty years ago, what I left and abandoned because I was afraid. You wow. kind of brought that back into in, into into spirit. So wow. uh, what happened was you know in, in that moment, and then the following you know months, the months that followed. Uh, I uncovered this, this 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 strong desire to teach people, mm. right? And this strong desire to to just share my gift, and my gift is the ability to see connections in the world and universe that allow us to see things differently. Yeah, and I do that better than most, right? Through story, through anecdotes, through humor, through passion. So that's my gift. And so I, 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 ha I had this strong urge to do that outside of the fitness world, right? In life, in business. And you told me, you said, you said, Coach Bobby back then, before we, we became close and I became your uncle, it was like, Coach, right. Coach the whole world has to see, has to see this, right? Mm. And, and you pushed the branding on me. You pushed the videos. You pushed... You know, all the reps I was doing with the with the with the video when you were filming me and you were like, you gotta do five today, ten tomorrow, whatever. Uh, which led me to the to, to the ultimate point where I realized there was this inner child that was that was a blockage that I had to address, right? So I went off to go train officially to do speaker training with my mentor to this day, Bo Eason. And mm -hmm. Bo Eason is all about story. He's all about vulnerability. He's different than most most public speaking coaches because he talks about just go up there, have your stuff crafted, have your stuff practiced, practiced, but speak from vulnerability, speak from story, speak from self um, experience, uh, and the rest of your selling of your presenting will do itself. So that's new. That was new. It's still new to the speaking world, but it was new to me because I had spent my life to that point, the last two or three decades of, of hiding that stuff in me, of hiding behind yeah. muscles, of hiding behind football, of hiding behind, you know, a career in finance that, that by nature is a, an alpha male type of a career. And I realized that I couldn't really teach the world unless I was human. And so the very, so I went to a three-day seminar uh, called called Personal Personal Story Power, and in that seminar, we are one of our objectives was to figure out what our story was. Mm. Like, what point in our life did we have something happening to us, with us, for us that changed us? And many of us don't don't even know until we think about it, but. I mean, this in this in this work we did, we were, we were forced to kind of sit back and figure out why we do things, and and everything we do, as you as you talked about, everything we do is led by that inner child. Absolutely, everything we do, right? Yep. We're either running to something or mm -hmm. from something. Talk about we're either it. holding on to something or letting go of something, but it's all from That's that right. standpoint. And so what I realized was I had been running 
from this shy, shy 12 year old kid who was one of the only black kids in his class in a military based community with all white friends and a stutter and a jerry curl. And I felt different and I felt mm. ashamed and I felt mad that I was different. And by, by the luck of how, how life works, I found something that allowed, that gave me a sense of freedom and control and joy. And I attached myself to that for decades. And so mm. for me, it was football. It was, it was this brand It was building muscle. And I realized in that moment when I was learning how to, how to, how to tell my story that number one, I had been hiding this part of me. Number two, I could not connect with people yeah. by doing that because everybody had a 12 year old version of themselves that they too were running from or running to or holding on to or letting go. And I couldn't help them with all my knowledge and metaphors and acronyms of, of, of disciplines and tenets of life. I couldn't help them if I couldn't connect to them. And I couldn't Absolutely. connect to them if I wasn't who I was. So that began this 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 still ongoing journey that I'm that I'm getting way better at of just being me. And and yeah. I, I said in our earlier recording of listening to that voice that on that day began to yell at me. First it was talking, but when I didn't listen for a few weeks and a few months, it was yelling. It said, What about me? What about me? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, I get it. You're strong and all, but what? A lot of that is because of me. What about me? Yeah. So, so, you know, we'll get into it more, but that, I still talk to that kid. Mm. And that kid still sits with me. That still, that kid yeah. still cries with me. I still cry with him because, you know, we have to connect and figure out why we are where we are, even if it's some, something that on the surface looks like it's a great place to be because we can go further. So there's a um, so, few things that really rang just as you were speaking. And one was this quote that I recently heard by um, one of both of our digital and soon to be personal mentors, um, Myron Scott, or Myron Golden, excuse me, I was about to say Myron Scott. Byron Scott, Myron Scott, oh, Laker. <laughs> is that, oh, is that what it is? Myron okay. Scott, yeah, I think, yeah. I, I think, yeah. If I, I did, know, yeah. Like, but um, Myron Golden, and he said that value comes from like one of two places. And he said, one of those places is the, the perceived or the actual lack we had as a child. So the things we value as adults mm -hmm. are based on the lack we perceived as children. Oh, wow. Right. So when you think to yourself, like the person who is so in love and infatuated with the idea of the Lamborghini is probably the kid who grew up without a car. Right. And so your value in that is so great. Or, you might be the kid who grew up in a household where there was no food. So when you grow up, a lot of your money, your finances go towards eating out, right? At the best restaurants and having the best experiences. And so there's no real dollar amount that you will cap yourself. And it was so interesting for me because I started to reinvestigate a lot of aspects of what I truly desire at this point. And one of the things that I realized like I value at this, at this juncture in my life is I have a deep, deep rooted desire of freedom. And so it expresses itself in entrepreneurship, right? Mm -hmm. Both you and I, like having a boss just doesn't make sense for right. us. Like we couldn't go back in that structure. And part of the reason of that is because at some point in our childhoods, we felt a sense of constraint. We felt a, strength, uh, a sense of powerlessness, maybe. Right. Right. Of right. not being able to do. Maybe either there was a strict parent in the household, there were certain guidelines that we felt were restricting us, or something internally gave us this feeling that I just can't be free. And so we have this deep desire to the point where we will do something as crazy as venture out on our own, right? Go into the wilderness where nobody else has ever traveled, right? Right. And right. build and create this thing that. You know, we're going to say everybody else is going to love yeah. or everybody else is going to gravitate towards when they've been doing the comfortable thing all along. Yep. Right. And so it, it, it re reminded me of like the beginning of my what I call my emotional healing journey when I first started to really come to terms with the, the reality that my past programming, my past traumas were 
ruling my life. They were controlling and dictating the way in which I live my life this very day. Right. Which is something I was really in denial about, right? And uh, I said this in the previous attempt to record this, which was like, I finally got this visual of an actual person, like the representation of a child, right? I finally got the image in my head of the true essence, like you said, Unc, which is you could literally see this child. You can see what it was about this child that you are, you began to run from, or you that you you saw something as a flaw, or you were told by the world around you was wrong with you, and so you try to compensate for it. And for me, I, I started again. I started really redissecting this um, this aspect of myself. And it's funny because I realized that though I was like the the part of myself that I was denying, the part of myself that I was neglecting, that child within was not only the holder of like the deepest truths about who I actually was, right? But it was like the gateway. So I I felt a lack of like purpose. I felt a lack of passion between maybe the ages of like, I mean, I had something I was like really invested in, which was music, but it was another way to compensate. It was a way to get me attention. It was a way to satisfy that, that belief that I was, um, not interesting. I was uh, not enough to be just seen for who I was. And those are traumas with my mother. Right. I'll right. Be honest right. Right. Her. Yeah. She's yeah. Covering. Uh, I felt unseen. I felt unheard by her. So I became an entertainer and I found ways to get it from everybody else, you know, in the hopes that it would suffice. And I started really looking at my life and saying, when did I lose the passion? Like, when did I lose the zest for life? Like, when did I lose, as we we're talking about before this call, you were saying, Unc, like that not give a F gene. Right. Like, when did, I, when did I lose that? And the further back I went, I realized, bro, like that person was locked also in that kid. Yes. Because that kid had the essence yep. of the very passion and purpose that I felt I was now lacking as an adult. Yep. So I would do things and they were lackluster. I would do things and they were kind of exciting, but not really, right? right? Just enough. And right. I didn't realize that trapped in that child was so much. And so this is really a segue Unc, to say, it, it, did you start to recognize immediately or have you come to a point of recognize, uh, a realization that in that child that we oftentimes run from or try to uh, neg- uh, neglect or we ignore, was there a point of realization that, damn, like in that child is actually the greatest gift for me? Like, yeah. That is who I truly am. No, per, no, yes, one hundred percent. So, so I realized two things. Um, it, it's a it's a forgiving of myself. Mm. Number one, forgiving of of this version of me. Yeah, and you know, w- one thing about me and you that that are the same, and and people will never guess for me for sure, and many people in your past will never guess who you are now for sure. Is yeah, I, I'm a thinker, right? I'm a, I I I am a, an introspective thinker, right? I mm-hmm. think about things more than most, and, and that made me a yeah. good football player. Even though I wasn't that fast, it made it helped me learn the fitness game and how the body works. Without you know, without being a kinesiology major, right? But mm-hmm. it can be haunting too because you over you overanalyze, right? Yeah. And so what I what I what I what I know to be factual from studying psychology and studying the human human behavior is that we hold these these belief systems that give us tremendous guilt and shame, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. About, about who we are, where we come from, what we've done, and um, like Brene Brown is big is big with that, right? Addressing mm-hmm. shame, we all have some, some level, of it, right? And I was ashamed when I realized what I had done to myself. I was ashamed of myself. Yeah. Right. Especially because I had begun speaking about all these these tools to be great to people, and ma- and many, if not most of them, were young people. Right. Mm-hmm. I was training young athletes. I was speaking in schools. I was doing all these things. I had my own children. I was. I was. I, I'm still mentoring. Hopefully. Um, and I realized that I had been a fraud in many cases because the, the the one child closest to me, my inner child, I wasn't doing any of that with. So step wow. one was I had to forgive myself for doing that. Yeah. 
Step two, I had to dissect why I did it, right? Mm -hmm. Because we all do things for a reason, right? We, you know, I understand now from just understanding how the brain works that we, that we do these, we create these protective habits and protective uh, psyches and protective personalities because of things that happen to us. And we do all these things because we have to survive. Our brains are, are meant to keep us alive. And so when they mm-hmm. see hurt or pain or, or embarrassment, our brain is wired to protect us from that. So it will create whatever it has to create in the way of identity, in the way of, in the way of self-talk, in the way of whatever it is to protect that. So I realized that I had built this identity around strength and courage and this separation from people in general. Mm-hmm. Right. So I realized that the one the one position I chose in football was the furthest away from everybody. <laughs> I, it's not by accident. I chose corner. I chose the one position that was least reliant on anybody else. Yes. Right. And I tell them, I don't need yeah. you. I, 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 I don't need, I play corner, but I don't need you. I still say that. Right. And, wow. I, and then I kind of catch myself and I'm like, dude, really? You're 50 years old. You still, but it's still part of me. Right. That, that Absolutely. need to not be vulnerable, to be embarrassed. Yeah. Yeah, it's still there. Then I chose finance, where I can go in my office. I didn't choose mm. sales. I didn't choose HR. I chose stuff that 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 I could be in a in a room with a spreadsheet and present my findings once a month. Wow. Right, not by accident. Right, I chose fitness. Right, where I can just rely upon this. It is literally isolation. Yeah, literally it's isolation. You. Go work out. You get buff. You and you come show me what, what you did. Right, mm. <laughs> so. I had to forgive myself because I created that to protect that 12 year old boy. Right. But just like therapists teach people now is that knowing what hurts you does not give you the right to not move forward. Right. No, knowing why you knowing why you are who you are now that you know why you are who you are, doesn't get you off the hook from going forward, mm. right? So you forgive yourself. You understand why you did it. Then you figure out how to move forward. And the only way to move, move forward for me was to embrace that part of me that wasn't yeah. perfect. And then like you said, and in, in your segue, when you what you said, when I realized that my real connection with people was really through him. Yeah. Like people don't give a shit about this version of me. That gets me in the door. Yeah. To a meeting, to a presentation, to a workshop, but that twelve-year-old boy is the one who is the one who does the value. He provides mm. the value because that, that's the one that everybody relates to. Mm. It ain't me. It ain't me. They want to be like me, like Mike. If I could be like right, but they relate to that kid. Now, if that kid can become this, they they can relate to that. So when when, when I so now. I don't hide my stutter as much. When I do it, I do it. I mention it, whatever. I, you know, I did a video this week about my dry skin, about being, about being uh, humbled, about being vulnerable. Uh, yeah. And in many ways, like you said, that 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 freed me to be me, right? And because of that, I can be abundant. I can move forward. I can teach. I can grow. I can love. Uh, and not apologize for it. But that was the moment when I, when I realized that I had to do that by, by connecting to that 12-year-old boy in me. This episode of the DNA of Greatness podcast is brought to you by the BTY Symposium. The BTY Symposium is an immersive workshop aimed at getting the student athletes the tools they need to achieve their ultimate dreams. Whether a one-day or multiple-day format, the symposiums provide an all-inclusive environment that nourishes athletes physically, mentally, and emotionally. Now back to the show. You also give others, uh, and I guess you would say a subconscious permission to be vulnerable themselves. Like something that I realized about human nature is that oftentimes we are not going to be the one who initiates something that makes us seem different in any way. That's by design, right? by our brain. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So again, survival mechanism yep. it's that if i stand out of the tribe i'll be left out of the tribe to fend for myself yep. right yep. 
But at a practical level, when we, let's say, look at a corporate setting, you don't want to be the one in a meeting who raises your hand and says something that's contradictory to what everybody else is already on, though it will change the company's trajectory. Yet the moment that you do, though you may not see it in that very meeting, there are going to be other individuals in there who finally feel heard, who finally have the courage, right? Who finally feel accepted in that moment, who feel seen, whatever it may be. And the continuation from there is actually you now give them this kind of permission. And I believe that's what true leadership is. Like that's what sets a leader apart. And, you know, we got into this culture where we speak of vulnerability, but I think we use that as a buzzword, kind yeah, of like self-love. Totally, totally, yeah, yeah. True vulnerability to me is just like the willingness to show your ass, right? Not in the physical sense. It's like the willingness to say, this is what I am, this is who I am, or this is what I'm experiencing right now, yeah. regardless of the consequences of showing yourself. Yeah. That's what makes vulnerability vulnerable, right? Yeah. Like it's not vulnerable if you know you're in a circle and everybody is just sharing with right, you. Exactly, right, exactly. You're in this therapy That's, that's so true. That's so true. Yeah, yeah. That's, so, and that's, that's a good point because we do think that if I go to a workshop and it's meant to be vulnerability workshop, everyone is, that's not vulnerable. That's a good point. No. That's a great point, yeah. It's, it's, this is what's vulnerable. You go into a circle of individuals who are complaining about their lives and somebody says, my life is actually pretty good right now. That's vulnerable. That's vulnerable. Right? It's right. something that sets the, the complete like atmosphere. There's a change, there's a shift in the atmosphere and it's a wholehearted, honestly, in spite of negative or perceived negative consequences. Yes. yes. And so what I started to realize is like, let's say as a child, you know, I built this um, protective mechanism of suppression of my anger because I was raised in a, a fundamentalist Christian household. And so anger was seen as a sin, right? Right. And so in order for you to be seen as godly, as saintly, you had to always keep your composure. And so I put on this facade of always been smooth and cool and everything is good, but I was deeply resentful and right. deeply bitter. Right. And I was deeply self-hating and you right. know what I mean? Like, yep. and I was deep depressive, but I wouldn't really admit it at the time. I didn't even... Like in our culture, we didn't even have the word depression. And that's how you know how far crazy. Yeah, you, exactly. Yeah. You know, you are from your own emotions. Yeah. And so, you know, when I looked at that and, and looked at like, man, I spent 25 years of my life suppressing anger. And when it did come out, it came out as wrath. And it came out as, you know, one of your videos that's about to come out, which is, if you can give the title for that one. Which one? There's a video you're about to put out about emotion. Oh, yeah. Uh, 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 misguided emotion. And then yeah. mis misplaced emotion. So it's, you know, exactly. it's about it's about yeah, it's about naming naming your thing or or assign assigning your emotion to others other than you, and then using that wrong assignment to direct your emotion to someone else other than you. <laughs> Boom. Boom. Which is the game. That's projection, yeah. right? Yeah. So you guys make sure to, to go peek that on coach's channel. But that that's something I realized like my life had been built on this kind of foundation of suppressing. The, I mean, uh, not suppressing only, but also projection of those emotions. Yeah. So the things that I was suppressing in myself, I started hating in other people. Mm. I started, you know, crucifying in other people, right? And I'll be honest right here, even like my sexuality, because I was raised in a church, yeah. we say it's evil. And therefore, anybody who was doing anything remotely sexual, though I was doing it behind closed doors, yeah. when I saw something that was hypersexualized, I would criticize it. I would ridicule it. I would be so harsh on it yep. because I couldn't accept that part of myself. Yep. Right? Yep. And I wasn't willing to be vulnerable. I wasn't willing to go against the status quo with myself. Right. And so I really started seeing that, man, all of these patterns of my life, like it really is this kid who was told something so many times that he started to believe right. it to be true about right. himself. Right. So, you know, a four-year-old, a three-year-old Bobby was not saying to himself, man, I got, you know, I got bug teeth, man, I got to stop. He wasn't saying any of this to himself. Right, exactly. But there were people in his environment who might have said that in order to, quote, unquote, protect him, right, right? Uh, in order for him to know, hey, just in case, you know, people approach you with this, this is a defense mechanism you use, or a way to get sympathy right. or empathy from others. You start to see others, oh, well, other people's shortcoming is getting them attention, so maybe I, I exemplify my own. And so... Four-year-old, three-year-old Bobby does not believe it, but he's told this over and over until that seven, then that 12-year-old Bobby now sees it as his identity. Yep. And we think that, oh, that 12-year-old version of us, it just disappears. Right. Nothing happens. Right. No, like 
Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve year old Bobby. All of them are still oh, in existence right. at this very moment. That's right. That's right. The messages they were told, the things that they believed, unless something was overridden on that program, unless some new story was told and, and believed and became a part of their life, every single belief that that child holds or held is still being held right, right. now and is still dictating our lives. Like Coach said, no matter how big the house is, you might have got that house right. that's no longer satisfying you because you felt scarcity, because your family told you, we're not the type of people who ever got our money together. We ain't never got no money. We're just poor people. We're broke people. We're middle class folk. We're lower class folk. Yep. And so you get in that house trying to protect yourself from poverty, but you're living in that house like a poor man or a poor woman. Right, exactly. Exactly. You know, and I, again, I wanted to draw these parallels, and I know that's a gift that we both have been given for just to shake folk up and be like, bro, this is impacting you right now. Yeah. Like, yeah. these aren't little ideas that you are listening to and concepts, et cetera. Like, you right now, wherever you are in your life that you are not fully satisfied or at peace with, it's not normal for us as human beings to not be at peace. Yeah, like, our exactly, spirit, exactly right. We don't come in this world that way. Correct. We don't come in this world. I mean, and every day that we're on earth chips away at that peace that we have naturally. Ooh. Am I right? Every single day you, you, you crawl, then you walk, then you run, and then you fall. Every single day. And what happens is, and you, oh my gosh, you said a lot. I, I, for all those who watch, I, I take notes as I'm, as I'm working. I'm learning from Aquarius. Um, stuff's coming to me. I'm getting ready to, to you know, add value. So, you know, I, I don't mind writing notes on my own podcast. Um, That's but I think one of the most underused words, and I've been using it more lately, is resentment. Mm -hmm. Like we, and every one of us has it. Oh, but like, before you get into it, I yeah. want you to do it, but I learned the, the meaning of the word. Did, what is like it? Last. So re is obviously to do again, to do again. right? Yep. The word sin comes from a Greek word. I guess it's like centuria, which okay. means fear. Yeah. So it's literally re-fearing. Re it's re yeah, Exactly. exactly. So, and, so please and, take this. And so, so I'm working on, so if you guys go back and, and look at our, our episode four about, mm. about feeding your, your, your subconscious, feeding your conscious, feeding your soul, um, you are what you eat, right? Episode four. Mm. It kind of gets into the result of not do of not recognizing this phenomena. Mm. Uh, I'm getting ready to speak. I'm preparing a, a proposal to do a full on workshop series at the correctional facility mm. in Santa Clara. Santa Clara. Can I say that? Because I can say what's that. Maybe I can't. We mute it out. Um, and I've I've done it before. I've I've spoken at at juvie. I've spoken at the adult uh, unit. Um, and so I'm now I'm getting ready and those are, those are just one offs, motivational, inspirational talks. Now I'm going to do like, I'm proposing to do like a three or four or five session series where we go, we actually dive into some work. Bless you. Bless you. Thank you. Um, and what's crazy is, is I, I watched, I watched, um, a movie on, on Netflix, uh, about these, these young, young men that were incarcerated. I don't need to say the movie. Mm -hmm. Um, and then it prompted me to, to just reach out to this guy who hired me to go talk a couple of years ago. And it was his birthday. Like that, like the next day was his birthday. So he invited me to a little shindig. I went out there, we met. And then this idea came to me. Um, but I began to think as I'm, as I'm watching, as I'm thinking, like there is no reality in our world. Like everything we, everything we experience is viewed through a mirror. Yes. Right? So if you imagine, like for me, it's everything. So I only feel buff because people around me look at me a certain way. Wow. I only think muscles are important because people look at me a certain way. Right? If I lived in the 20s or I lived, um, you know, in the 1700s, I, and when they didn't value six-pack abs and they didn't value biceps, I, I wouldn't be. That would have no currency. Right? So if I was a lion and I was raised by zebras, I wouldn't know I was a lion. Yeah. So everything we do, everything we are is, is only that thing because of what the mirror tells us it is. Right? So since day one, 
dig deep in this message. This is so a, since this is day a since day one, that's been how we've defined ourselves. So it was, it's not always that that people said I had buck teeth, or people said I was ugly, or people said I was. It's 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 the mirror. It's what the reaction is. Now, yes, there was some comments, obviously, but how people act, including people who love you, how they act dictates kind of how you feel and yes. that grows. And when it becomes uncomfortable, which it does inevitably for everybody, for some reason, all of us go through that. Then whatever we have to do to pivot from that feeling, we do to survive. Yeah. Yeah. And, and and inevitably leave behind that former self. So for me, it was all of that. And, and and I recently even understood that part of why this is gonna be this is gonna be crazy, but part of why I'm so driven and 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 something to make me worthy of of living on earth. It sounds crazy, mm -hmm. right? But but I want I want I want to do something of a grand scale. Right. It wasn't yes. go to the NFL, then it was be a CFO of some major corporation uh, and, and give back to the community. Now it's use my voice and my and my passion to impact people in all kind of platforms. But I've always wanted to leave a huge implant implant on this on imprint, not implant, imprint on this world. And I finally realized why people are like, man, why? You know, you are great. Oh, I want to be great. I want to be great, great. Mm -hmm. But you are great. And, you know, my wife, my kids, people who, who my, I coach, but you are great. You should just enjoy life. And so it comes from this. And I realized this. My mother, since I told her I wanted to play in the NFL, was outwardly proud of me. Wow. Like proud of who I was going to become. Like bragging about me. I would go to the store, the commissary, and everybody knew who I was. Oh, you the guy, you the boy going to, going to, the, going to the NFL. I, no, I, the Jackie's boy. And so the pride she had for me was palpable, right? Uh, my dad was quiet. Still still is quiet. Yeah. But I knew he was proud of me. But he wasn't yeah. overly expressive. But he, was, yeah. he never missed a game. Went to my college games. Warriors, Warriors blue and gold. Comes to my son's game. Wearing whatever color his teams are. So he's always there. Always, always visibly proud. But never verbally, not never, very seldom verbally acknowledged it. Mm. Right? So that 12-year-old boy who became 13 and 14 and 15 has been spending my whole life trying to live up to what my mom said I could be and make my dad admit that's who I was going to be. Right? My whole life I've been trying to do that. And it goes back to that 12-year-old boy that was like, I'm going to get you a house, mommy. And my dad just kind of being in the background and not saying anything. But part of who I am now is trying. I'm trying to be great, and that's part of the reason. I, you know, to make my mom, to make whatever she thought I was, to make her. I always say in my, in my talks, I, or I've said it several times, to not make her a liar, and then to give my dad something to finally speak about, about his son. And he, again, he, my, I love my dad. He's it's just who he is. He's quiet. He's he 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 says he's proud of me in his own ways, but that twelve year old boy still wants to hear it from him, and wants to just live up to whatever my mom <laughs> my mom thought I was. So it's crazy how, you know, we are we're attached to the. And until you address it, I I, I just thought I was driven. I'm I'm different. Yeah. But until you kind of sit down with it, you know, and do that work, you know, you don't know. But we're all kind of led by that. We're. It's funny that you mention the most important aspect, which is the parental role in it, right? Is a child sees their parents, regardless of how their parents have showed up. Like some people have parents who completely abandoned them. If your parents were there or they were absolutely not there, if they're helicopter parents or if they're completely negligent, at some level, we are all still yearning for their approval. 100%. Right? Yep. Like one inkling of their approval yep. might be all that we believe that we need. And it's so incredible because, you know, when I'm speaking to uh, to my clients, uh, I bring up like the entanglement of relationship, more specifically our parent-child relationship, right? And how I don't think we really understand the complete impact that your parental figures have on you 
until you watch them without judgment. Mm -hmm. Like, I, and I don't mean like you, you just watch them. Like mm -hmm. if you have an opportunity to watch your folks yeah. or even think about them or something like that, if they're no longer here, yeah. I know that's a lot of people. But for me, Pops, uh, uh, I was looking at my Pops and exactly how he talks to my mom and how exactly how he engages. And I was like, I've said and I've done and I've even, I know why he's saying the thing he is, even though it's covert, yeah. I've done the exact same in order to get the exact same result out of the woman that I'm with. Right. I'm talking about so specific, so nuanced, something I've never uh, looked to, something I never learned from somebody outside, but yet it was something I observed a thousand, yeah, a times, thousand times as a child. And so for me, it became, that is the symbol of love. And so that's also started giving me this deep level of, of empathy for the inner child and everybody else. Because if we started to see each other as that inner child, right, 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 we will start to recognize like, damn, that's your wounds of that kid talking. Exactly. Like that's the, the thug, the super thug. Exactly. The one who's squaring up with anybody, the one who's toting gats on anybody. Yeah. That guy right there, that's that seven, eight year old yeah. who is trying to protect himself from right. not getting his butt whooped right. by the very same person who he believe is supposed to love him unconditionally. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And until you, the, the and until you see that them. part of them, you won't get it. No. You won't get it. You won't understand until until you can sit down and look for that. You're right. Look for that inner kid that has produced this. You know what I mean? That's that's so true. That's so true. And, and you, said, you said the most important word, which is forgiveness. And so, you know, a lot of us, we, we cringe at the word forgiveness because we've been demonstrated. I don't think it's actually just the way it's taught. Like, I do believe it's taught correctly. But the way it's been demonstrated for most of us is, let's say, you know, mom is in and out of toxic relationships and she keeps on bringing the man back in the house, yeah. you know, or pops, you know, continues to say how uh, terrible the work uh, workplace is, but he continues to put up. Like, we learn forgiveness as actual lack of boundaries. And that's not forgiveness. That's right. Right. That's different. Yeah. Like true forgiveness, they say, in its truest essence is the letting go of something absolutely and completely. Right. Which is different. Yeah. Because forgiveness, usually we think, okay, I let the person back in my life, but I won't forget. Yeah. Right? Yes, not or, yeah, exactly. or, or I let the person out of my life and I don't forget. And I, and I hold on to it. Yeah, exactly. Correct. Yeah. yeah. So we suffer in both of those situations. Both of them. Exactly. Whereas and they're not, and they're not usually, by the way. <laughs> exactly. No, bro, I'm telling you right now, the thing that really changed it for me when I really started like living a lifestyle of forgiveness is when I realized, bro. Your your resentment towards them is not going to convict them, because I already knew it's like it's a toxin to yourself, it's a poison, and I can even feel it in myself. I'm yeah. so in tune with myself, yeah. and I know you are. Uh, when I yeah. even have a bad thought about somebody, like I feel like yeah. you know, I just ate junk food or something. Yeah, like, exactly. I feel terrible, yeah. sick to my stomach. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yep. But but I started realizing, no, bro, like not only that, but the reason why you held on is because you believe that you holding on was going to get that person theirs. Yeah. And that comes from, again, a lack of understanding. It's like, bro, anybody who came and hurt you intentionally, betrayed you, uh, neglected you, rejected you, whatever it may have been, that was their inner child. The one who made fun of, you know, the buck teeth, the one who made fun of my height, et cetera. All of those individuals were literally operating from their own pain. Right. And again, like we talk about the bully. Yeah. And what I said before, again, as you go through life in the mirror, the mirror for that kid who was teasing you for being short or for me for being, you know, dry skinned and stuttering, that kid at some point realized, okay, I'm overweight or my dad left mm. my family. And if I bully this kid, I feel different. I Correct. feel pain. I feel power. Correct. So, I, so I'm 11 and I go to school and I take this kid's lunch, lunch. Cause I, cause I don't have lunch. I take this kid's lunch. Now I'm full and I feel powerful. My dad just, just beat me. And I felt powerless. Now I feel powerful, right? So again, that's that's wow. the petition situation. But that's again, totally good, it's yeah. the small child in him. It's the mirror that he sees the world through, and it's the reflection. All of a sudden, that I feel better from this. Wait a minute, from this viewpoint, I feel better. And when you're eleven, mm. you don't give a damn what what the reason is that you feel better. You just feel better. Yeah, you can blame a twelve year old kid for feeling better. You can try to teach yeah. him, but you can't blame him. Correct. Which one of us does not want to feel better? We all want to feel better. So it's up to us to identify and teach them. But it's, but any person, any animal, 
is going to seek a better feeling. And so yeah. you're right. If we view everything from that standpoint, like, oh, snap, okay. Because, again, the minute you're, you, you get slapped on the booty and you're, you're yelling, all you want is peace in your world. And every day, mm. after, every day from there, you learn all the negatives of life and you find ways to pivot and feel better. Right. If I cry like That's crazy, so if, I cry, if I cry like crazy, my mom will change my diaper. It's not a bratty kid. Uh, He's just trying to feel better. Uh, and this yeah, world really shows him that if I cry loud enough, I'm going to get a diaper change. I'm going to get a uh, bottle. I'm going to get that toy I want. I mean, it's, 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 it's all sure. human behavior. This is OK. Now, you need an entire seminar on this. Because, <laughs> OK. Okay, so I'm thinking right now. I'm thinking right now of addiction, right? Mm -hmm. And most of us think of an addict as somebody who's strung up somewhere in the streets, right? Yeah, living in in either homelessness or abject poverty or whatever it may look like. Yet, every single one of us has one or a few addictions. That are based off of exactly what you said. Feel better. It is simply, and it's again, Talk to me. our level of judgment on those we can see externally dealing exactly. with their Talk stuff is the way that me. we feel better about our yeah. own stuff. Talk so to me. That you peep this, peep this. Uh, and this is actually something I was saying on a call with one of my clients. I told her, I said, what are the two ways we get to, we start feeling better about our situation? Um, Funny enough, I did use this exact literal. I said, what are two ways we can feel better about ourselves and uh, if we feel wronged or whatever it may be? And she said, well, one is we validate ourselves, et cetera. I said, oh, yeah, that's it. And she said, another one, we deny it. And I said, well, I might have to make three categories. Yeah. <laughs> but I was thinking of two things, right? I was thinking of two, which is one is self-validation. Mm -hmm. And number two is judgment. Yep. So the moment I judge you, I start to feel better. I get better. Yes, exactly. So it, as adults, that's the, the more sophisticated way. If I cut you at the knees, then I'm now ahead of you. Exactly. Right? As exactly. opposed to, you know, this thing of inspiring one another, iron sharpens iron. We both climbed. I see you getting it. Then, you know, it inspires me to get it. No, let me chop you down so that I look better. And so, you know, it's funny because when I started getting into like the power of manifestation, the power of the tongue, one of the hardest things to wrap my mind around and even to articulate to individuals was this thing of like the way that you converse with the people around you. So I would say, and I would put my money on this, is that at least 60% of conversations are slander, gossip, back talk, Easy. talking about somebody that's not there Easy. in a negative way. Yep. Right? Yep. Whatever way is justified, we can justify what we want to justify. Yep. But at least 60%. At least. So I said, man, if I cut out gossip slander talk my folk behind their back i would be real quiet <laughs> like i would quiet, have to talk quiet bro <laughs> i would really have nothing to you ain't got <laughs> nothing to say dog nothing to say you know what i mean yeah and so it's like i, I really started again i really started deep and it's like bro, okay why are you actually gossiping like why do you talk about folk? who are usually the people that you talk about well it's people that you actually feel insecure about yes so, you know, when I was young, I would surround myself with people who are, let's say, quote, unquote, not as smart as me, right? Or doing worse things than me. So it's like, oh, I'm selling, you know, I'm selling weed, but he's selling coke. Right. Or I'm selling pills, but he's selling uh, heroin. Right. 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 That was my perception yep. and my mindset. At least I'm not doing what they're doing, yeah. which is one level of judgment. But the other was anytime somebody around me, and I really do want to take a little dive into this because it shows the impact of that unhealed inner child and unlistened to inner child. So I get into a relationship and in that relationship, let's say my girl brings somebody up and she's impressed with this person, right? So I've built my reputation unk, and my self-worth off of uh, how much of a utility I can be to others, yep. right? That was like my main thing yep. is like, how can I help? How can I do? Whether it's cleaning a dish or giving a word. So if I feel like I can't contribute, or I used to feel if I could not contribute in that way, then I was worthless, right. deemed absolutely worthless. Yep. So now I'm in a relationship with somebody and uh, that feeling is coming up. So maybe I'm trying to do, maybe I'm trying to teach or whatever, but it's not registering. And then now even worse, 
she now brings up somebody who taught her something. Oh, snap. So now I'm triggered absolutely. Uh, oh, yeah. Right? Yep, yep. And I'm thinking in my mind, right, in the in the rationing brain, well, it probably has to do with because, you know, she's probably like thinking of him or she's flirting or whatever. But in reality, it's actually that fear within me of, oh, I'm useless now. Right. That's what right. I'm actually feeling. Yeah, yeah. It's like, oh, damn, like, then I don't have, it's not about her. Like, not oh, about this her. is self-centered. Nope, nope. It's nope. self-centered. Yep. It's, man, so if you're learning from somebody else, then I have no use value. Nope. I can't, I should I can't be enough just in and of myself. Damn, it's, you know. Exactly. Oh, my and, gosh. It's, it's so true. It's it's your currency that you thought you brought to the table. Now somebody correct. has more of that. Right? Correct. Like, exactly. Wow, Okay. Exactly. You, yeah. you thought she was with you for the muscles, and now she's talking about somebody with bigger muscles. Yeah. Not even saying she wants them. Exactly. She's just, oh, wow, look at that person. Exactly. Oh, she's even trying to hook you. Oh, maybe you should connect yep. with them. Now I'm mad. Yep. What the hell? I ain't trying, yep. to, talk. I ain't trying to talk to no damn body. Yep. Oh, so what are you saying about them? Like, so, oh, so I'm not enough? Right. And so we start to become triggered, and we think those triggers are external, but really every trigger that we have in our lives, and you know this and you've experienced this, is a representation of the unhealed wounds of that inner child. Every all single trigger. Yeah, all of it is. Every yeah. single yeah. one. If I'm mad about anything, if I feel upset, if I feel resentful, frustrated, whatever it may be, I may feel as justified as I want to. Yep. God be my witness. I'm justified off of this anger, righteous indignation. But the reason I'm triggered is because there's a part of me that fears rejection. There's a part of me that fears having that shame put on a pedestal and everybody can see it and is going to laugh at it again. And is eventually going to lead me into that place of of abandonment. Yep, hundred percent. And if we can look at it from from a child's eyes, it also becomes simplified because everything comes down to I'm afraid of being left alone. Yeah, that's yeah. the baby's worst the baby. fear. Yeah, exactly. If the baby had a fear, baby really doesn't have the fear. We get the fear imputed into us, right? Right. Right. Because right. baby trust that to be taken care of. But yeah. if a child had a certain sense of rationality they would say to themselves i just don't want to be left alone right i don't want to be alone and so everything starts to get based off of that so again i'm now either in relationships or i stay very far from them right i now play quarterback because now you can't reject me yeah exactly lie, lie, yep, lie, right. you can't you can't abandon me i'm already by myself right and that's how I lived most of my life. I became so independent, so radically independent. But in reality, I was the most afraid person to be rejected. Oh, yeah, exactly. I mean, and, and we still, I mean, again. This episode of the DNA of Greatness is brought to you by Aquarius Wave Apparel. In a world filled with complexities, what we yearn for most is simplicity. Well, this is your answer to simplicity. Most people go to go to their deathbed holding on to whatever that thing was that kept them from fully living, right? From fully mm. living as the full whole being they are. Most of most people die with that, whether it's a fear of trying to start a business or the fear of of trying to get into a relationship or the fear of, you know, connecting again with your children because whatever it is, mm-hmm. right? We go, we let that child connection that was that is broken we don't fix it at most of us most of the world doesn't wow. fix it or address it and they go to their deathbed with it but yeah. if you don't just let it go you are probably going to be and it's okay because it, it, it makes life beautiful as it as it as you unwind and uncover a new knot right it's like this yeah. endless this endless uh string that, that could be your abundant life has all these knots and the knots suck. But as soon as you untie one, it's like, wow, it's a little longer and a little Three, looser. Yeah. It's a little looser, yeah. right? So most yeah. people go, go to their deathbed with this short ass string with all these knots in it. That was okay. It may have been okay, right? It was not horrible. But had they tried to just untie some of the knots, it would have been so much more fulfilling. So my point of that of that was you know, I'm 51 this year and I'm still mm. willing to untie some knots because yeah. I want my next 20 years to be wonderful. I want the next mm. 20 after that to be wonderful. Even though I've had an amazing life so far, even though I have great children, I have great friends, I have a great wife, I, my mom and dad were good to me and my brother and sister are wonderful. I've been able to make an impact in this world. 
um, I want more. And so yeah. I'm, willing, I'm willing to deal with, because it's work, right? And to yeah. me, it's enjoyment because you're like, man, okay, if I just figure this out, it hurts for a second. And a second being like a week or a month, right? A second of like universal time. But after that, it's like, ooh, you know, because we don't untie a real, a, a real t- a, a, a knot. It's like, man. It feels good. Give me a pin, dude. I got to go in here and get this, right? <laughs> But once you do it, it's like, ah. Oh. Even though it's not like, there's no physical relief, you're like, ah. Oh. Like, you're a dad, right? You have to tie your kids, to tie your kids' shoe. Like, I got it. I got it, babe. Hold on. And then she's all, let me try. Let me get it. I got it. I said I got it. And it used to be like 20 minutes, right? Leave me alone. Leave me alone, right? But when you get it, you're like, ah. There you go, son. There you go. Go play. Go, go play. Go play, son. That's how wow. it feels, though, right? Wow. Go play, son. That is but hilarious. that's our, our kid. So that's a good analogy, right? I just thought of that one. Our little bitty kid in us is like his shoe was on our lap. 12 year old Bobby's shoes on my lap. And he's like, Can you untie this knot? And I'm like, mm-hmm. For 40 years, I've been busy. I'll, I'll do it later. I, I tried for a minute. I can't do it. Come back. And now I've taken some time to untie it. And he's like, Oh my God, thanks. And he runs off for, you know, for go play for an hour or two. And we both feel better. Yes. And he comes back tomorrow. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't, I didn't see the one over here. Dad, can you do it? And you just, if you embrace that as part of the journey, I think mm. it's fun, man. I think it's, yeah. I think it's painfully and, and oddly fun to untie so, these knots. <laughs> I'm so glad you went this way. This is how I know, like, this whole podcast is just ordained by the spirit, like, 1000% spirit, spirit based. I'm even, like, feel out of body right now. I know that's, that's that's I've never thought about that analogy. That's a good one. That's so good. And the reason why it struck a chord with me, all pun intended, is we run from the things we believe are gonna bring more pain, more suffering, right? Yeah. And the things that we believe are going to bring us more pain. It's almost like we live in the upside down. I was yeah, never a uh, bizarre world. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We, we live in the twilight. Like we live in this world where it's like the thing we believe is going to bring us satisfaction is actually the thing that takes us away from it. Right. It's like this dichotomy of like happiness versus pleasure. Um, Maha and I actually talked about it in the healing circle in the episode coming out. And basically in that, is this dichotomy of if I just sit on the couch and eat these potato chips right now, I'm going to feel so good and that's happiness. But in reality, it's actually the very opposite. The very opposite. Yeah. Right? Yep. And then if you think to yourself, man, if I go to the gym right now, if I, you know, clock in two hours on building my business and spend the last hour of the night with my girl, just get into like, oh, that sounds like a lot. Yeah. And it sounds like an effort. And so ah, that doesn't sound like it's going to be fun. So but enjoy. yet, when you're in those activities or after those activities, they always yield an exponential return always, for us. Yeah, always. 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 So it's so ironic because it's like it's disguised. So I feel like the same like disguised um, like emotions, right? We say, man, if I just chase the happiness or if I just chase the ecstasy, then I get the ecstasy. But in reality, it's when you face the very opposite thing that you get the happiness yeah, or exactly. the ecstasy. It's like running in the opposite direction, right? It's like you're running into, the, like you run into the storm, exactly. right? To get in the middle of where, where safety is at, right? Right in the middle of it, where the safety is odd, but right yeah. in the middle where, where the safety is at. You go, you go remember, the, and there's a, even a thing with the ocean. They say in the middle of the ocean, after the biggest waves is where the calmest yeah, is. Yeah, exactly, yeah. The entire ocean. yeah. But you'll, 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 you'll get this, um, this well, analogy, but it's really just a story based off a movie you've seen sandlot obviously Mm -hmm. and the entire premise of sandlot is what the dog you describe it the beast the dog so again so so there's these kids we're playing yeah 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 they knock their ball over uh over a cage or over a fence yeah and basically the whole movie is them getting the courage to hop the fence because there's this big scary dog on the other side there's two pieces right there's the scary dog and the owner right and they're both horrifying mythical beast right and and me yes. yeah exactly yeah exactly and so uh spoiler alert for anybody skip this part if you haven't watched the movie and you plan on go watching watch it. Spoiler alert. go watch spoiler it spoiler. absolutely i'm going to give the spoiler alert now basically the kid who ends up on the other side of that fence 
like the first they see this beast that is coming after him and then they're on the floor and it looks like it's attacking him but it's actually this big old dog starts licking him, right? Licking him. Yeah, yeah. Owner is James Earl Jones, one of the nicest granddaddies of all time. Blind, blind. <laughs> yes, blind. blind. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so that analogy has like so, has sat with me for the last like month and a half. That's a good one. Because I realized like, bro, like every single one of my fears has been that dog and that owner. That's, that's, every that's single so one. true. That's so true. And then you go over there and like, what the hell? I was scared of this. <laughs> you know what I mean? I was scared of this. Do, doing a podcast? I was scared of this. <laughs> and it becomes your friend. The yeah. very thing you were yeah. hearing actually becomes the thing you're in love with, the thing you spend time with now. Like yep. you're saying, oh, with yourself, a podcast. I was the same way with a podcast. Yeah. I didn't know I was running from one. But, I, I, you know, we started a, a year and a half ago to, oh, maybe, you know, we yeah, don't do it. Yeah, yeah. We started about, a, you know, eight months ago. Oh, yeah. don't do it. Don't do it. Yeah. But after I realized now, like, stop running from the thing that's in you. This is one of my most fun parts of my oh, week. Oh, absolutely, man. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, time goes. This is, the, this is the happiest hour to two hours of my life. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> exactly. The oh. very thing we feared most. And so, Unc, I really want you kind of to bring us into a conclusion with, and this might be stretched out a little bit, however much it needs to be, but is like, again, we now talked about the value of getting in touch with that child and truly that you're going to experience more of life is for yourself. Are there things that you do, ways in which you live, in which you always make sure to pay attention, to listen to that inner child? Yeah. Oh, that's deep. That's a great one. Um, so I think for me, right, I think, I think, once I sat down after after that initial workshop and, and I and I kind of figured out what was going on, mm-hmm. um, I began to to consciously look for moments when I could hear that child speaking. And I think we all I don't think I know. I know we all yeah. if we are if we quiet down the noise. Like you were saying earlier that if we spend less time, you know, gossiping and, and watching negative, you know, te- not negative or you know, there's no there's no real neutral, right? So if we watch yeah. non healthy uh, or, or listen to not if you stop listening to and watching non healthy um, food, right? You know, uh, you know, mind food, mm-hmm. and if we stop regurgitating, you know, unhealthy thoughts and, and speech, our our worlds quiet down. And when that happens, wow. as we go through our lives, we we are doing the same things we always do, but instead of avoiding and, and ignoring the friction that happens when those moments that remind us of, of what we did to our former child selves, mm. instead of quieting it, just listen. And when those things happen, your soul will tell you the steps to take to address it, right? So for me, uh, like I told you, right, I was driving home from Southern California. My son had a football camp and then I did a few speaking engagements and then I um, stayed with a friend of mine from college who's doing very well in real estate and I was mad. You know, the podcast that we mentioned was based on on that emotion. My, my I was mad at my current fitness clients. I was mad at everybody around me who, who, who doesn't believe I'm a, I, sh- I could be a speaker I was mad at them when in actuality it's me right it's yeah. me not giving any kind of credence to that 12 year old boy who wanted to be a teacher who still wants to teach the world about life so I was mad at myself and then and then because of that I was projecting emotions on the wrong people you know I'm mad mm. at my wife for wanting a nice purse I'm mad at my daughter you know, because she wants to transfer colleges and it's more money. I'm mad at my son for interrupting me, you know, when he should have plenty of time with me, right? And it's all because I'm not doing, I'm not honoring my inner child. So mm. when I do that, when I, when I, when I, when I feel that, I immediately do the things that my heart tells me my 12 year old boy wants me to do. And that is a podcast. That is, you know, wow. my social media. That is, Mm. My book that is do things that mentally detach me from the old self that was running from that. So all my fitness and football and physicality, branding, you know, mentally move away from that. Right. Don't attach my soul. You know, it's just small things, but I do things 
in direct contrast to the thing that I that I'm doing now that is running away from that inner child and trying to put mm-hmm. myself right in the middle of that storm, right? Trying to untie that knot, that knot. So for some people, I'll give you examples of, of of if you're listening, how does that relate to me? So for some people, that might that might mean calling your dad. Right, when you're driving home and you see somebody, somebody with their with their dad, and you, and you get mad and like shit. Oh man, okay, okay. My dad and I have issues, so I, I, yeah. I resent them. So you call them, or you might it might be that you are driving, and or you're hanging out with some friends, and one of them, you know, just got back from a vacation, and so you're mad because you didn't start your business. So address that, right? You know, go home and study. Go home and figure out a way that you can. Start your business slowly. So my point is you will be, you will feel this friction because you're allowing yourself to, hopefully you're allowing yourself to quiet the noise, right? Yeah. You're not always filling time with things and people and places and drinks and food and activities and all these things. You're allowing yourself to be, to, to quiet. And when you do that, your, your child, your, your inner self has been talking to you for years. Absolutely. And so, and you feel it because you feel sick to your stomach, you feel mad, you feel angry, you feel all these emotions that we make up to make ourselves feel better. So don't, you know, don't kill yourself for, for feeling that way because we're, we're doing this to protect ourselves. But listen to it, understand, figure out why, and then do the things in that moment that directly help that relationship. And so that's mm-hmm. what I do. And, and, and I, you know, this podcast commitment was one of them. Yeah. Like, why would why would I want to do that? Why would I want to you know be on a podcast and well because you want to reach the world, and so this is how you do it, right? Yeah. And and the fact that you don't want to do it regularly, the fact that you want you always want wanted to not anymore. You always wanted to make sure you were showered and shaved and had a nice shirt on and you did push ups. You know now you can kind of get on there with a, with a, with a farmer's tan and just do it. That those are all steps. Those are uncomfortable mm-hmm. knots that I'm untying, but recognizing in the moment that there's something you can do and then doing something that that addresses that discomfort is what I just keep doing. What I love about that process, and I again, there's a whole nother seminar right there. <laughs> like that's an entire seminar. That's an entire symposium. That's an entire speaking engagement for the people. But I don't know if that's hella loud or not. Oh, it's all good. People know we have stuff going on. Uh, What I was going to say is the reason why that's so impactful is because you address this aspect of doing the things that make you uncomfortable and how, again, as counterintuitive, counterintuitive as it may seem, it's actually that that is healing the inner child because the inner child was told that they could not. So that's the actual thing we're addressing, right? Is that lie of yes. worthlessness. Yes. Is yes. what you're doing like, yep. in that process is every time that somebody told, you know, that child version, that inner child version of ourselves that you could not, it is now our job as adults to tell them, yes, you can. Yes, you can. Yep. yep. You are worth Right? Yep. You are literally addressing those lies and showing them through the way you're now displaying and living out your life. And so it is actually a gift sometimes. Like we, you know, we view trauma in a, a multitude of different ways. But for me, I've actually started to, of course, address it and see it and accept it for what it is and how it happened and whatever. But then the second level and second step for me is to say, like my life becomes not in spite of, but because of. Yes. Yes. Right? Right. So so if you take Joe Jackson away from Michael Jackson, Thank you. does Michael Jackson become Michael Jackson? Nope. Exactly. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. 100%. That's not, that's not a message, parents, to say, go beat your kids to a pulp. But it's to say that there were certain things that Mike had to come to terms with in order to become the fullest expression right. of self. Whatever you may believe about right. this man and whatever is, uh, you know, maybe up in the air. I don't know. I didn't know him personally, but one thing I know is that to this day, he is still seen as a king of an entire genre of music that is the biggest genre of music, which is pop music, right? And he did things that still today have not been matched. You can take Michael Jordan. Would Michael still be who he was if he was told as a kid, like, you were not enough? Yeah, exactly. 100%. Would he? I don't think so. No, no way. No way. You know what I mean? Yeah. 
So in our story, it's like, you know, little Bobby, if he was not the stutterer, would he become the immaculate speaker that he is? I don't think so. No way. And so now we're literally taking that and we're using it as our fuel. Again, not denying it and suppressing it because those are also ways you can disguise. You can just be like, well, I'm just going to use it for, no, 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 I don't mean it like that. I look at it like I'm hurt, like I was hurt, like I feel this type of way, like I feel like these people abandoned me, these people, you know, uh, betrayed me, whatever. Face it, look at it, accept it, but then see through it and see past it, right? Right. You're now like the observer of it. And so um, my last little piece is really, again, and I now preach this for the rest of my, my natural born life, is, again, spend time with yourself, right? Unk said, like, get away from all these distractions, you know, and be in that silence. You have to find a form of meditation, intentional meditation for yourself yeah. in this life. Otherwise, you're always going to be in that state of friction, of anxiety, of deep depression, of dis-ease, et cetera. Always. always. There's, there's no, there's no in-between in the universe. You're either, you know, again, growing or you're decaying. Right. Yep. And so for yourself, it is of the utmost importance for you to create, to cultivate a intentional because you say, oh, well, I don't have the time. No, you create you time, create the time. For exactly. every day. Yep. You do it every single day. Yep. So you're basically just saying, I'm putting me last. That's all. Right. So we just have to change the narrative and say, when you, I'm putting me first. And that's the only way that, again, everything else in life is going to function at the highest right. level. Right. That's how we've been built. And so, again, yeah, my message is prioritize the time for you. And everything else will start to fall into line for that. Okay. Everything else. Mm-hmm. Like everything I ever wanted has been showing up on the other side of like me prioritizing self. Yeah. And it seems scary. It seems selfish. It seems self-centered, whatever. That's okay. That's part of that aspect that you're going to overcome in the process. Right. But this is the gateway to the greatness that you desire and everything else. And so that's my last message. Uh, any closing, closing message before we wrap? I just want you guys to understand that you have inside of you this this length, this linear linearity of greatness in your life, right? That has some mm. knots in it currently. And like we said in this episode, guys, if you guys begin to just uncover that part of you that, that it has so much beauty in it that you're hiding from, running from, uh, you can begin to unravel some of these knots and you can unfold what I un- I know to be a wonderful, amazing life of greatness for you, for me, yeah. for Aquarius, for all of us. So I love you guys. I, you know, I pray for you. I lead you. I teach you. I run with you. Um, and it's it's just an amazing journey that I'm 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 so happy to be a part of with you guys. Yeah, it really is a blessing. It truly is. Yep. Love you guys. All right, guys. Until the next one. Peace. Be it now, and then it will come to you. You can't wait till you get it to become that thing.